Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tony Effick and I'm a co-founder of Black and Brilliant and welcome to the next in the episode of our series Get to Know and today I'd like to introduce to you Steve Jones. Um, Steve Jones is the founder of Pockstock, um, somebody who I've come to know over the last year or so um, who has been doing some incredible things, some interesting things and, and this man has a really passionate point of view um, for the community and some really enlightening views that I would love just to share with all of you here today. So without further ado, I'd love to firstly just introduce Steve to you all and just so that you get to know him a little bit more. Um, I'd love for you, Steve, just to kind of, you know, for those who don't know Pockstock, um, do you mind telling us a little bit about it and then your role in the company? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here and allowing me to share my point of view with, with your folks. Um, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I've founded several companies in the past and Pockstock is really just a continuation on my mission to, you know, increase diversity, increase representation, create generational wealth. So what we do is we essentially create and uh, provide media to companies who want to increase representation. So there are a lot of companies out there right now with the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion goals who want to increase the presence of black and brown uh, folks in their media. They want to increase LGBT presence, uh, differently able folks. They want to increase LGBTQ plus uh, uh, people in their imaging because that's what the world looks like. Wow. Wow. Um, I was going to ask, my next question was going to be what you hope to accomplish, but you, you kind of hit that right there. <laughs> you hit that right there. Um, well, there's a lot I want to accomplish, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Some of them are personal goals, and some of them are goals for our future generations, right? I want to build something yeah. that allows future generations of Black and, and Brown people um, BIPOC, all, all of the monikers that you can attach to underrepresented people, underserved people, underappreciated people, uh, I want to create a platform for them to stand on so that they don't then have to now look at themselves with anything other than pride. Pride for being different than other folks, see the beauty in themselves that, mm. that other cultures get to see in themselves and their culture. I want that for every human being. Right. So wow. we're not looking to take it away from anyone. We're looking to balance it out so that everyone can look at themselves with pride, no matter how different they feel they are. Yeah. And I think, um, Steve, what, where your business sits as somebody who worked in advertising for years, it feels like there was a lot of unwritten rules in this business around what representation looks like. Um, who gets included, who doesn't get included, the ratio of people who get included versus, you know, there's always usually if there's five, there's one, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, I, I had a, um, so I've used many of these other, you know, before you came along lots of these platforms before. Um, so what do you think, what makes Pockstock different from its competitors? Well, we have a couple of different types of competitors. So you have the larger stock if, if you're talking about the stock aspect yep. of our business, right? Yep. So there, there's some of the larger uh, stock uh, sites like Getty, Shutterstock, Adobe Stock is now uh, becoming a player. I, uh, iStock is a Getty company, but they're also a player. Um, they created, Getty created the stock market, the stock media market. Like they literally created the market. Um, so what that created was for companies to have the ability to easily find imagery for their advertising without having to go out and invest in uh, photo shoots and things like that. So it, it created a convenience. Now, in order for that convenience to, you know, kind of be convenient for everyone, when diversity and inclusion became a priority for companies, it was not a priority for a lot of these stock companies, right? Or they mm. were not able to solve it in any meaningful way, even if they tried. So what makes us different is that's all we're about. We're all about diversity, equity, inclusion. <laughs> and I would even add justice there, um, yep. you know, Jedi. But uh, I would say that that's the main thing that makes us different from a stock uh, standpoint. We are from the cultures that we represent. 
we understand the nuances and the beauty of the things that other people, they don't normally get. So those standards of, of beauty, those standards of what's common and, and you know, um, what people really have come to understand, this is what this means has been set by people who are not from the culture. So other people have defined what it is to be a person of color through imagery, through video, through other forms of media. And we're here to help redefine that and also to claim it. You know, we have to claim our own story, our own narrative, our own imagery, our own present, our own beauty, our own culture. Like we have, yeah. who, else, who else could tell our story better than us, right? Absolutely. For, for decades, as long as there's been media, other people have told our stories. So most times they're getting it wrong, right? So we're here to help get it right. You know? I love that. Yeah, no, there, there's so many nuances to our cultures and people don't understand it from the outside looking in. It looks odd to them or it looks different or intimidating or too passionate, too angry, too this, too that. But, it, you know, sometimes it's just the way, you know, different people are. Like some, yeah. we don't have to understand what makes everyone different. We should just respect that there are differences. And maybe that's a part of your journey to get to know some of those differences. Yeah, right? I, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. And I wanted to jump on that about, you know, telling our story. One of the things that we see is kind of like how we are represented. And one of the areas is in, is in mainstream beauty standards. And so, um, you know, for example, when there is somebody who's considered to be beautiful and black, there is a kind of a, a, a look that comes with that, you know? So it's, it's kind of European features. Even these days, they didn't used to happen when I was growing up, but these days, even if there's a darker skin tone person, the features are still European. Um, so have you seen a shift in how um, beauty standards are represented? Are they more diverse? Are they, are they, are they different? You know, how do you, how do you even, you know, you have users of your service who maybe are searching for an image and they're saying beautiful black woman or whatever it is, or, you know, what, whatever label, how do you even talk to them about this space? You know, how, how do you think about this space? So that, that's a very good question. And it, it's, it's, it's a very nuanced question and it's a very layered question. So from a macro standpoint, the beauty standards were set by our Caucasian, you know, uh, advertisers, media executives, folks like that, uh, beauty brands, they set the standard for what beauty is. And obviously they see the beauty in themselves and they understand themselves. So it's okay for them to say, this is what I think is beautiful because this is from my perspective. The challenge is, is that that perspective then now becomes almost a global perspective of what beauty is. And because those things were winning for them, um, advertisers, media companies, beauty brands, they continue to do it. And there was a risk in saying, let's change that model. I know diversity is a thing, you know, uh, uh, Hispanic, Asian, Black folks, uh, indigenous folks are becoming more of a populate, a uh, bigger part of the population. Blacks represent a trillion dollars or more in spending. We have to cater to them somehow, but can we take the risk of putting a Black person of a certain type of look out front of our campaign, will that turn off our, our potential customers, our customer base, right? So it was, it was perceived as risky. Can a black person of a certain look hold a certain role and carry a certain role in a movie and, and be the lead? You know, it was always a big deal for a dark skinned brother like Wesley Snipes to be the yeah. lead or, and there's only one at a time. So when he's done, then someone else should take, there's always an archetype of what one person, uh, what one role or one image of a black person could be. But when it comes to beauty, um, I have two beautiful black daughters and they're beautiful to me. They're beautiful to, to us. I don't expect my standard of what's beautiful to become other people's standard. So when it comes to pox dot, we try to avoid using the word beautiful attributed to any image that's on our platform because the standards that were set already, we don't want to then now start to do the same thing that was done to us, to other people, right? Absolutely. Because our way of doing it is everyone has the opportunity to be beautiful to someone else, right? We don't want to then now start saying this 
model, this talent is beautiful, and this one isn't, right? So we have all types of skin tones, hairstyles, body types, you know, just style, you know, style of fashion and dress. We don't want to handpick this one is beautiful and that one is not. That's just not our position. We want to include a space where everyone can see the beauty in themselves and other people can see their beauty as well. I love that. That's how you disrupt that model of someone sitting in a position to kind of sort of curate what people see and then say this is beautiful and that's not. I, I think that would be, uh, for us to continue that trend would be uh, against our mission and our ethos at Pakistan. I love that. I love that. And as a father of a daughter, um, I kind of empathize and feel what you're feeling right there. And so I love that. And it's funny, I'm um, perking my wife. We talk about that Wesley Snipes concept a lot because she's a, she's, she's a huge, fan, <laughs> huge fan of Blade when it came out and what that represented when he was doing that. That was a huge deal for uh, yeah. uh, Wesley Snipes to be the lead of a feature film like that, a blockbuster film. That was a huge deal. And then once yep. Hollywood saw it wasn't as risky as they perceived it would be, then it opened the doors for others. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, so another area, very related, but almost kind of, yeah, not, yeah, very related area is, I, I think, and it's happened through years and years of actually me living it, seeing it, viewing it, is this idea. I have a very clear idea in my head of what a successful business person looks like. If someone says to me, close your eyes, you know, it's just, it's, I've just embedded, it's just kind of become ingrained <laughs> in me over decades of living the life I'm looking at. And if you just, and if you just, if I ask you to think of a CEO, we all kind of have a similar thing in our head, even whether you want it or you don't want it, there's a view in your head, which is a, it's a white guy, slightly older, usually with gray hair, distinguished looking. We all have that kind of image in our head, that stereotype of what that looks like. And you see that a lot in, you know, in, in, in the popular media. But if somebody was searching for an image of a black executive, mm. so that mm. kind of label, yeah. I see where um, you're going. I have a different idea in my head than <laughs> we all pretty much have different ideas in our head because I, I don't know if that concept, that category of imagery is yet fully established in anybody's head. That could almost look like anybody right now. So how do you go about um, deciding what images get tagged in that way? If I was searching for black CEO, black executive, you know, we don't have a common image. How, how would you go about so solving for something like that? Yeah, that's another great question because um, that's sort of similar to the beauty standards. Mm -hmm. right? So it's going against what's been established in people's minds, right? So when you think of the image that Caucasians have put in the media, it's usually they're rich, they're successful, they're the bosses, they're the decision makers, they're the politicians. They're usually at the top of whatever food chain there is. And um, I don't think that, I remember the Cosby show when that first came out, right? The reason that was so mind blowing is because everything we've been taught through books, TV and other forms of media never showed the possibility of an upper middle class black family, a black lawyer and a black doctor raising these kids together. It was never, that pitch of success was never uh, or not never, but not often seen in the media. It's the same thing with successful black businessmen. I would say a black CEO, a black executive should look like you and I right now, mm -hmm. right? So we are what black CEOs look like, but that's not traditionally what people would associate. Like you said, there's a certain archetype of what we've been fed through the media. And there are folks like that, and I'm not you know, uh, saying anything against them, I'm saying now that you include more of us in the mix, that entire picture is going to change and it's still forming. You know, Jay-Z is a black billionaire, right? Yep. You have to put Jay-Z in a picture next to Bill Gates, right? You have to put these folks like, and people can't square that visually until they get used to it. Just like we got used to seeing other folks as successful, you know, with the Wall Street business suit look, you're going to have to see us Jay-Z with his hair and, and his looks and his features and his presence and his style and his sweat. That's what you're going to have to start seeing as success as part of the, the, the picture of success. Like it should show each and every one of us um, and inspire everyone. Yes, we live in a time where you have Barack Obama, 
you have Kamala Harris, you have Jay-Z, you have Kanye West, you have Tyler Perry, you have Oprah Winfrey, all of these successful black, um, black people who are reaching the top levels that historically we didn't have access to. And even if we aspired to, we wouldn't even know what that looks like. Now we have a blueprint of what that looks like. You can come from different backgrounds and mm. still ascend to the highest points of the American dream. And that should be as clear to anyone today as it's ever been, because we now have more and more people accessing that American dream, not discounting all of the other under, you know, the, the underbelly of all the other stuff going on in America, not to minimize any of that. But I'm saying there's never been a time where there's been this many black successful people, especially black women. I love to see mm. black women now becoming leaders of fortune 500 companies and, 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 you know, one heartbeat away from the presidency. It's like, I love seeing that, 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 that should be an inspiration for anyone who's looking for inspiration. That's amazing. I always felt that energy from you anyway, Steve, from the first times we spoke about somebody who's so passionate about this. But I, you use the word blueprint, you link Jay-Z with that. And um, <laughs> and the word blueprint is interesting as well, um, because even in the Black community ourselves, we have different blueprints, right? how we look, how we act. Um, you know, sometimes there's fierce debate, um, engaged debate around within the community about things like skin tone, hair, um, you know, you know, beauty standards as we talked about you know how have you navigated those issues um i i i don't have a good answer for that um because yeah. those are issues that they're they're deep and they're they're personal to people like it, it's it's going to take a lot of time to navigate those issues and one of the things is is that we're new to a lot of what's going on today we're new to the possibility of holding cops accountable for killing us in the streets. We're new to wealth and, and being at the highest levels. So there's a lot of cultural self-esteem issues that we've been living with for decades, being treated yep. as other, being treated as less than. So to now look at ourselves, the way we want other people to see it is a challenge, right? So we have to see each other in a beautiful way. We have to connect with each other we have to look at our similarities and differences, share with each other so that we can now have other people, we can hold ourselves to the standards that we want other people to, to, to be held to, right? So there's a lot of things to unpack in, the, in, in, in our community, it can happen. But I think this moment in time is the first time that I felt optimistic. And I think unfortunately, you know, rest in peace to George Floyd, but he unearthed his mm. passing unearthed a lot of these conversations that absolutely had to happen. And it took that tragedy, that murder, for people to then now feel comfortable with having these conversations because now they're forced to, right? So conversations with ourselves about ourselves have always been taboo. You cannot be critical. You can't be Black and critical. be critical of the Black community or different aspects of how we could do better without then now sounding like an other. Right. Yeah, so we, yeah. we, have, we have to find ways to positively have those conversations. I think some people have tried and they just they haven't done it. They haven't done it effectively. So it's going to take some time. I don't have the solution for it. Just keep pouring love into the community. Keep pouring money into the community. Keep trying to lift all boats with the rising tide that's happening, you know. So, yeah, I, yeah. It's like the, the, the um, time is a great healer, but time is also a great revealer. You know, Absolutely. you know, I mean, so I, I feel we're still in recovery stage. We are, you know, we, a doctor, we, very rarely can a doctor heal himself. So it's hard to know what you've got until you can the benefit of time to look back and say, man, OK, that's what was happening. there. I didn't know that. And you know what? For anybody who wants us to rush to get over everything, we're always being asked to rush to get over everything. Why, yeah. why are you still talking about George Floyd a year later? Because it didn't stop happening. Like we literally live with PTSD. Like we literally yeah. live with PTSD and we're always being asked to get over it. Like that's an impossible standard for any person to live with, right? So the fact that we can live under those conditions 
and still smile, still be happy, still go out and be productive, it's nothing short of a miracle. Yeah, you know, absolutely. it's nothing short of a miracle. I'm proud of my people for what we've come through and, and where we're going. I just, what I want is accountability in this moment. Hold ourselves accountable. Because if we look back 10 years and see how wide the door is open to us and we stood on the outside complaining about the color of that door, I'm going to be pissed. Because mm. we have an opportunity right now to open that door, enter the door, and pull 10 more people in through so we never have to look back. We don't want to... Yeah. We don't want to build backwards. That's that's we don't want to go back to where it was. So yeah. we need to open up the door for every able-bodied black person that we can right now. This is the only time I'm I'm 50 years old. This is the first time in my entire life that the door has been open clearly, and I can see it. I'll just let me just add to that because I think when people hear you say, "Oh, you know," you're not arguing that we shouldn't mourn those other things. But what we're saying is that there's a kind of a selective bias that we should mourn all of those things, which are obviously things that we should all mourn. But we should also just, but there seems to be kind of like a selective nature bias around. Uh, but the, those things, because when you go deeper into some of these issues, you actually start to realize that, oh, well, th those things kind of didn't happen that, to people like us. Because this is as if those people, when we talk about enslaved people, for example, we talk about something as recent as, Jim Crow, you know, that's within, <laughs> that's within, you know, people's grandparents' lifetime. So these are very recent things, but we, 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 we haven't mourned them. There hasn't been a moment. There hasn't been time for people to really kind of recover and look at that objectively. Right. There's, there's no, there's no healing period. Um, yeah. Not often a healing period for black folks in America, um, especially not the descendants of slaves. Um, there, there's always a rush to get over things. And that, that's, that to me is the tragedy. We should be able to mourn and support our Asian American uh, Pacific yeah. Islander folks for the, the things that, that are going on with them as we are. We should have other cultures join us for protesting, you know, uh, police brutality when it happens. We should also support any, you know, any other cultures who are being, uh, you know, oppressed or, or, or in their freedoms are being infringed upon just as a human race. Like that's just should be how it is. You shouldn't tell one group of folks their tragedy is important and the other group of folks that their tragedy is something that's made up or they should get over it. And like it's, yep. it's yeah, in yep. general, I'm, I believe in getting over things in general as a, but there's some things that you can't get over if it's still happening. Like there has to be closure <laughs> for you to get over something. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I, I think what's interesting about you there, Steve, because I, I see you as a person who you've acknowledged and you know and you're aware of these things, but it, you seem super, very positive, though. You're an optimist. You said, I don't, I don't get a sense from you of any energy of, like, I'm not just going to get on with stuff. You're a serial entrepreneur. You, you just, because for some people, that weight is, the, is a weight that they can't just get off themselves to kind of get on and do stuff. But you seem to be able to just shake that off and just keep going. Yeah, um, that it's, it's difficult sometimes, but it, it's, it's necessary. And uh, I'll tell you this, and it's going to sound odd whenever I tell someone this. Um, I try to keep my life empty and meaningless. That's, mm. my, that's my secret. I keep my life empty and meaningless. And what that means, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a coded language from a, a, a class, a course that I took many years ago called Landmark Education. And they, I took away a few good points from that. And what I was able to process from that course is that life is a series of experiences. And the way I, I kind of describe it to people, imagine if you were born with a clear set of glasses and yeah. every experience you have, whether positive or negative, colors that glass. So you get used to it like a fish gets used to water. And you go through life seeing, uh, uh, seeing life through all of these shades of color. So that colors your ex future experiences, the more of that you bring into the next situation. So what I learned to do is to keep an empty space, meaning it's void of as much past clutter as possible. So I don't fill my box with everything that happened to me since I was born and bring that into every situation. I try to keep it as clear as possible because things are always happening. So it's always filling up. So you got to complete it. You got to clear it out 
and you keep a clear space. So I try to keep as empty a space as possible. As human beings, things happen and then we add meaning to it. We make it mean something. Someone bumped into you. Oh, they must be disrespecting me because they bumped into me and blah, blah, blah. Someone's having a bad day and they come into your or in your orbit, you make that mean something, right? So people say things happen for a reason. I say things happen and then we find a reason for why it happened. I try not to attach reasons to everything that happens in my life. So I don't add meaning to everything that happens in my life because the thing that happened, happened already. The meaning, yeah. is, the meaning is what lives on. The meaning is where the pain is. The meaning is where the, 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 the heartache is. The, the, that, that meaning is what causes most of the problems in your life by attaching meaning to everything. Not everything has a meaning. Sometimes things just happen. Most times things just happen and there's no intention. I don't try to figure out everyone's intention or why they did yeah. something. It just happens. Things happen. And if, uh, and that's why I'm able to kind of go into things and come out of it without bringing all this, this extra baggage with me. You're just seeing me without all the baggage. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I was going to, yeah, cause it, I, I took, I took to, I talk about that since my wife and I have conversations about it where we say, like thinking about what's in other people's heads and why other people do what they do. Um, one of the other things I'm really interested in is that your father, um, your business owner, you know, um, which by definition, mean, by definition means you wear a lot of different hats. So both professionally and personally, and also you're somebody who is, you know, you're an activist, um, you, 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 you do many things, you know, and so how do you balance all of these dimensions of your life? Because I think one of the reasons I always like to ask people this question is that sometimes people who haven't reached the level you're at look so glossy and shiny from the outside, but can you talk a little bit about how you just make it all work? Well, I live in a multiverse, so I have five me's <laughs> happening at the same time. <laughs> no, I, um, no I, um, I access my network. Um, I'm one of those people who I can't, uh, I can't sit still for long. I, I recharge my batteries when needed. I take needed breaks. Um, I take mental health days when I need to. But for the most part, I have an amazing support system between my wife, um, my, my older sister, who is like my mentor, um, my team and my friends. Like I'm able to, um, I take on a lot. You know, my team is always telling me, well, yeah, no, if we did this, we can get that accomplished. I'm like, well, if we aim for this, we're only going to get here, but we have to aim here. So if we fall short, so I'm always taking on more and more and more because I always feel there's always more to do. Right. So in order to get all this accomplished, I have a, uh, I built a support system around me always getting things accomplished. So you're right. I'm a, I'm a husband. So I'm, I'm, I'm here being 100% husband to my wife. I'm a father, so I have to be present for my kids, homework, class trips, all of those things. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I have to put 100% energy into making sure that Pockstock goes from concept to enterprise within the next five years. I'm out in the community, so I'm helping friends and colleagues and talking to kids at school when we were able to get out and those sorts of things. So I, I, I try to put 100% a, a of myself into each thing that I do. I just can't do everything at once and I can't do everything for everyone. I can only do, I can only push myself to the limit of my, that my mental health will allow me to push. Um, Cause I got to conserve some for me for the next mission. Right. So it's, 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 it's my network. It's, it's, you know, I have a high bandwidth. I, I sleep three to four hours a night. Um, and then I'm on, like I'm, I'm on from 3 AM to 10 PM most days. Like I'm just, I'm just wired that way. I'm, I'm wired to carry a tremendous amount of weight, keep retain a tremendous, tremendous amount of data, um, and be connected to thousands of people personally, like literally having individual conversations with hundreds of people, sometimes thousands, depending on the, the, the mission that I'm on and, and who I'm. So it, it's, I, I don't know what it is about me that makes me that way. I just know that it allows me to help change people's lives, helps me to build things and, and see things through. 
do you think sorry just do you think people can learn that is it something you have or you don't have or do you think people can learn that so i i think people can learn it um it, it's so one of the things i did in the past i was in the music industry and you know i went from someone asking me can i rap and i said sure i'll give it a try to then starting a music studio or record label touring around the country with Wu-Tang and a lot of those early 90s rappers and and then you know having record deals you know people offering record deals uh, that didn't pan out but they were offers on the table and it was it's one of those things like I have always been someone who could come up with an idea and then put in the work to see it through where I see mm. other folks they have the idea but they want to go from idea on the back of a napkin to Forbes list in six months. And uh, it's just, it's just not how the journey works out for, for most people. Like you got to be able to put in the work, you know, like yeah. um, it, it's, it's a work ethic. And, you know, Diddy went from intern to, to mogul. Like you have to have that work ethic. Jay-Z, hustler to mogul. Steve Jones, you know, Caribbean Islander soon to be mogul i mean it's, it seems some success but not definitely not billionaire status yet but um you know I, i'm on my way i, I want to be on that i want to be on that list of, of, of people yeah. who can snap a finger and change lives like that's really what i ultimately yeah. want to do i want to change the way the dynamics of how people interact are especially when it comes to people of color i want I to yeah. It's going to happen, man. It's happening. I can feel it already, man. Just because I think also, like, it's one thing having the dream, but it's also knowing the steps to get the dream and then putting the work to climb those steps. So all of those things are kind of like part of the formula. And it sounds like that's kind yeah. of what you're thinking about. It is. It's definitely a formula for success. And I think one, it's incumbent upon anyone who achieves a certain level of success, whether it's in their careers or their entrepreneurial ventures to turn around and then share some of that with the next set of folks coming up because we don't need 10 black billionaires. We need a thousand black billionaires. And that's the only way to build generational wealth. You know, no. like, yeah. My, my next question is like, this is, we usually end this way. It's a pretty deep question. And it's basically it takes you back to your childhood. Yeah. If you met the 10 year old you today, what would you say, you know, what advice would you give of any? So just think about that 10 year old, Steve Jones walks into the room right now. And then you can just share one thing or a few things with that young Steve Jones. What are the things now with the benefit of life and hindsight that you would pass back on? Well, if I can hop into that DeLorean time machine and go back <laughs> to the future. Um, <laughs> Um, that's a good question because in context, that 10 year old Steve Jones was the odd duckling out. He had mm -hmm. just, he just had just came to this country from Barbados, um, came in as a kindergartner, but he was on a fifth grade American level, uh, fifth grade level. So he knew the answers to all the questions that people didn't know. And he raised his hand a lot until he realized that that wasn't how Bed-Stuy operated. Bed-Stuy <laughs> Brooklyn was about these, not this. So he stopped raising his hand and he felt different. He felt like an outsider. It was a time where anyone outside a country was treated, they called, they had derogatory names, coconut, West Indian coconuts and things like that. Very derogatory names. So that guy felt like an outsider and he had ideas. He was really smart and he started to suppress those things, those differences to fit in. I would go back and tell that guy that um, it's okay to be different when you grow up that difference and that different perspective is what's going to make you unique. It's what's going to make you special. It's what's going to give you a unique uh, value and don't, don't, listen to the outside influences from the media, from the folks around you. Um, because at that time, you know, it was right, you know, Reaganomics was going on, the crack epidemic was just coming in and everybody was going from, to becoming tougher and tougher. And, you know, I, I obviously, you know, I, I survived it. So I had to also develop some toughness about me. And, um, 
you know, I would just say, listen to your own voice. Like you're, you're going to be okay. Like it's okay to be different. It's okay not to fit in, you know, or, or diminish yourself to fit in, you know, like to, to play yourself down. Like I did, you know, and, Powerful. yeah. To, to kind of fit in. And that's uh, incredible. Yeah. To your voice. And I tell that to my kids now through that experience. Like my kids are also leaders. Like they are the leaders of their respective groups. Each one of them, they always have a group of friends around. And I'm telling you, I said, don't try to fit into the crowd. Be yourself, and the crowd will try to fit with you. And, That's to you. Yeah. And I, you know, my 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 catchphrase. I'll leave you with this: is um, don't be a product of the environment. Make your environment a product of you. And wow. that's what I teach them. I think um, Steve just did some profound insights that I think our community is going to be able to learn from, um, and I think be inspired by as well. And so, um, this get to know series is really about revealing profound insights, and I think that's kind of what we did right here is what you shared with us today. So I just like to end by just saying, you know, big thank you um, to you, Steve Jones, founder, CEO of Popstock. And if you didn't know Steve Jones, well, now you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> For better or worse, this is me. So I, I appreciate it. And thank you, Black and Brilliant. Um, definitely appreciate the work you guys are doing. You have my 100% support. I appreciate it.